Hey, this is Matt once again. We're about to know videos of the paid requests, this time from Mike, OCB Communications. Thank you so much, my friend. And for those interested in requesting any type of videos, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box. Now, this is for a documentary called Evocatua, the Morton Downey Jr. movie. It came out, I guess, around 2012. This is a lot older than I thought it was. Not too long ago, I got a request from another person to check out an episode of the Morton Downey Jr. show. And it was interesting to watch it. And then the I knew Morton Downey Jr. was a, had a TV show. I remember him the most for being the reporter in Predator 2. Hey, Harrigan, more death, more mutilation. And Danny Glover knocks him out. <laughs> and also his WrestleMania appearance where he was smoked in and Roddy Piper used the fire extinguisher and hit him full force with it. But I didn't know much about his show. It only lasted two years. From 1987 to 1989, but when it hit, it hit big. It hit big time and became kind of like a pop culture thing almost immediately. But it's what I say about supernovas. It could be a show that can shine twice as brightly, but burn out twice as quick. So it goes into the show and who Morton Downey Jr. was. It was it was a good documentary. It was a lot of information I didn't know about because I knew very little about the guy. Uh, sadly, they don't go into a whole lot of his life after the show. Other than when he passed away. Or even in the midst of it. Like, it would have been nice if they touched on his WrestleMania appearance. Him being in Predator 2, how that came about. That would have been nice to see, but... It's mostly concentrating on his past or the show itself and how controversial it was. And like you watch it, you just see why people why why is you just see why it was controversial, but you also see why it was appealing to people. Because it was the audience selected sportsmen identifying their needs, dreams, and frustrations. And I think it's a... They get footage from the show. They get footage from back to the day where Morton Downey Jr. was fairly, fairly young. And he was actually the son of... Morton Downey Sr. was a very successful tenor. Very successful, successful senior. And apparently because him and the wife didn't get along and they got divorced, he wouldn't allow the son to see the mom and vice versa. So more than likely the mom got, became an alcoholic because of that. And I think Morton Jr. resented his dad for that and how dominate, domineering he was. So you get the idea that he wasn't a big fan of his dad. And this kind of deep down thing that he wanted to be more popular than his dad. He wanted to be more successful than his dad. And then it talks a little bit about the the show itself. And they get a lot of people interviewed for this. They get Bob Pittman, who is a founder of MTV. Who helped get this show you know, on the air. They interview fans, including Chris Elliott. He was a fan. They interview fans who were actually in the audience, and there's an entertaining bit where they're in a group and they watch themselves when they're like 17 year old talking about these political things and just how rough and tumble it was, and then reflecting upon it. Uh, they talk with Morton Downey Jr.'s daughter. They talk with some of the other people, some that were on the show. Or were guests on the show.
they talk with the producers on the show. That, that way you get a bit more detail as to what was going on during that time period. And when you watch pieces of the show, it's a fairly, it's very confrontational. And that's kind of what Morton Downey Jr. did was provoke confrontation amidst all these political points. And something to be entertaining was like, like, the, at one point he's talking to this researcher and the researcher says something really stupid. He's like, it hasn't been proven that AIDS are sexually transmitted. And Morton's like, are you a researcher? Are you really a researcher? Shut up. Why don't you shut up? Shut up. Why don't you shut up? Or at one point he's talking with a feminist and say, I thought anyone who had breasts was a feminist. And talk about bra burning, and he's like, "Listen, almost no feminist who ever had anything they had to wear a bra for. There are almost no feminist they had anything up here that they need to burn a bra for." And then the draw fire back, same to be said for your jaw strap. I mean, when you watch clips of the show, they say I can understand the entertaining part of it, but at the same time, it's like he spoke for a group who was frustrated, who wanted their voices heard, and the group loved him so much that it's almost like they became a mob. So if he came in with an opposing view, it was like not just Borden, but over a hundred people cursing you out and calling you an asshole and all this other stuff, which was fun for ratings at first and was fun to watch at first, but they detail later on how when you do that enough times, you stop having legitimate guests because they're like, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to deal with not having my say and just having all these people crush whatever I'm attempting to say. I don't want some guy trying to poke his finger in my face. Advertisers like Domino's, they don't want to be on it. As they put it, because we don't want to be there for when he finally bellies up and says something incredibly stupid or incredibly dumb or self-destructs. When he self-destructs, we don't want to be there for it. So because you're not getting much advertisement, because you're not getting more, quote, legitimate guests, and it becomes less about the, the strong political talking points, it be, instead it becomes about Oh, God told me to come here. Or, what was it? Someone who had like no arms and no legs but could play an instrument with his tongue. <clears throat> and as he, it, it became more like a cartoon, as they put it. Which I guess some people would say kind of like what happened with Jerry Springer. And that's the thing, like, when you watch Born Downey Jr., you kind of see. I mean. There's a lot of people Bill O'Reilly or Alice Mr. J The Frauds are gay you know him Mr. Alex J There's a lot of people that whether they admit it or not seem to be influenced by Born Downey Jr.'s passionately angry push of his persona that gets people attracted and intrigued because people are intrigued of with a fight or a battle or an argument or, or something to the fed just to see what would happen next. But yeah, you do see early footage of a very young Morton Downey Jr. And he tried to be a senior like his dad, but it didn't really work out. He even did this one show, and there are people, including like Dean Martin. And Dean Martin's like, hey, you know, that studio he did, you know, sold him short because I'm pretty sure he's a good senior. But where they had him in, and there was this echo, and I'm like, wow, I didn't think I, <laughs> I would see Dean Martin in this. And it's like black and white footage. 
And it wasn't a bad singing voice he had, better than mine, but it wasn't nearly his father's or any of the other sort. But yeah, it was an interesting story about this kind of quick rise and fall of this guy. And one thing I also enjoyed was they put in these animation moments. Really good. I mean, they look like if political cartoons were all fully animated. Kind of that style. And there's a bit where you see like cigarettes walking in a march. Or there's a bit, or there's another bit where they tell a story about, oh, I found this Time Magazine with his dad on it. I thought he would like it, and he saw it, and then he got you know, beast mode and ripped it up. And like I said, the animation reminded me a bit of like Pink Floyd's The Wall, like type of thing. I thought it was very unique, and I thought it was a interesting, interesting way to recreate moments that we hear about but they don't have footage of I thought that was a nice uh, nice addition to to the documentary I want to say you get a sense of the popularity and the height of it and how people were into it and how the audience it was like if a talk show had a hockey audience and like I said, the fans watching themselves from way back when. And yeah, these the confidence of the like these Jersey folks and these pissed off people giving their own opinion. And you kind of see that later and stuff like the Jersey Shore or uh, other shows of that nature. And he also gets a sense about his like daughter saying, I didn't really like seeing my dad on there because he was a different guy. And then people say, well, when he did that on the show, it was more of an act. And kind of like he didn't even know what point to say. They would do this kind of meaning, like, what, what point should I take? But apparently like, he was very good at remembering stuff. So when they pitch him, like, you should say this, you should say that, he would say it verbatim. It also goes into his fallacies, his problems. One of them was that the more success he had, the more he became a womanizer. So lo and behold, he did cheat on his wife and you know, he did stuff that you're not supposed to do. I think there was some girl they hired, some lady they hired and he wanted her to hold his dick when he was pissing. So it was one of those like, okay, he was a bit of a dirt bad when it came to women on that front. They go into this whole story that I didn't know about, about Tawana Brawley. And this is probably the most interesting part of it. And I'm kind of... I... It's too bad they didn't get Al Sharpton because they mention about how him and Al Sharpton were kind of friends with each other and Al Sharpton was on the show a couple times and I don't know if they ever asked Al Sharpton or he just decided not to do it But it would be nice to hear Al Sharpton's point of view of all of this. But what happened was this girl was 15 years old. And she accused that four white people did all this stuff to her. And they interview one of the guys who was accused, Stephen Pagonis. He's interviewed. And apparently you kind of find out none of that was true. And in fact, there was this argument on the Morton Downey Jr. show where Al Sharpton, and who was 
gonna about this and yes this is what happened we need to find you know, like a mob we need to find these white people we need to get them and there's another guy who is also a black guy saying wait a minute what she says doesn't add up the evidence doesn't add up because when you look into the case for example she was found with feces on her but the feces were like her neighbor's dog witnesses saw her put herself in this garbage bag she said she was outside for all the this many days but she has no hypothermia and her body didn't seem like it was outside at all she said all this stuff happened where her like shoes and stuff were all cut up but her feet were perfectly fine she was all this stuff was written on her chest but there went in a, in a way like you could write this way so the stuff was upside down and think okay if you want people to it is a lot of weird things that didn't add up. She said she was assaulted, but they did a, a kit, and there's no signs of that happening. And then if you look it up, I wish they delved even more into those facts. Only I, I looked it up, but I wish they delved more into the documentary of those facts. They just do a little bit. Apparently, like her, what dad or stepdad stabbed someone like a dozen times. It was like some weird stuff, and it seemed. And the Supreme Court said, "No, this, there's no evidence that this really happened." Even the guy was getting up in Al Sharpton's face about it not happening, and even pushed Al Sharpton, and Sharpton is in a chair and falls. And for a split second, I'm, I'm waiting for the Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. <laughs> and in a way, I guess that's why, for example, many years later, you got Jerry Springer, which lasted a lot longer. In fact, how long did Jerry Springer last? Because I think what happened was. Jerry Springer was a lot more of an easygoing guy. He was a host, but he kind of let the guests do the whole thing. And maybe the guests would get into a fight. Maybe the guests would get into an argument. Maybe the guests would get into a... Going back and forth, but it was based on the guests themselves. Also, Jerry Springer never really got into... I don't know if he really got into politics that much. But again, because he himself was not so confrontational, I think a lot, a lot more guests, a lot more things that come on. And also, it, the right time and the right network, in this case, Fox. said 27 seasons 4,969 episodes Jesus from 1991 to 2018 Chicago, Illinois what's well, this NBC Universal had a hand in it it was just the worst TV show of all time but yet it lasted like around 26 years 27 almost 5,000 episodes a lot more than the Martin Downey Jr. show and again it's because you had a lead you had a figure that was just so angry so confrontational that some people again didn't want to do it. They didn't want to deal with it. Nowadays he'd be called toxic and what made him a star was also what made him a downfall and a liability for people. And then him being a womanizer and him being a hothead. They mentioned this thing where he was supposed to do this show and it's like, hey, 
you know what a sixty year old farts and then brings her out and be like what are you talking about this is what we want you're supposed to be speaking for the people but it's like I wish they got a bit more maybe to the psychology of what he was thinking by doing that kind of stuff But yeah, it goes to kind of the downfall and kind of the last thing is his feelings are slipping because, like I mentioned, it becomes legitimate guests don't want to be on because it's too hostile. Advertisers don't really want to be on because it's too much of the friction. And he would do, like, college shows. At one point, there was a show with skinheads. He was found in a bathroom... His hair cut. I guess supposed to be a swastika on his face. And he, he talks about it. And people didn't believe him. People doubted it. Because people doubted it. Like oh well okay this guy. Who always, who's always going on about telling the truth. He's always going on about being truthful. Being honest. If he's going to lie about this, then what else is he going to lie about? It's kind of, hey, kids, there is no Santa Claus. <laughs> what? So, that definitely closed the book on the show, if anything else. And then, lo and behold, the, the guy who's like Morton's best friend, he admits it was fake. After all these years, he says, yes, it was, and even I lied about it. I don't know why I did it. I even thought it'd be the end of it, but he wanted to do it. Does he want his sympathy f from his new wife or girlfriend? And then pretty much it cuts all the way up to many, many years later, and then his bout with lung cancer, him being on... I forget what it was. On CNN. Him being on CNN. And. Talk about. What he's going through. And you get the idea. That by the end. He wanted to apologize. He wanted to set things right. He wanted to. It was just too late. And he died in 2001. And this topsy-turvy, fairly unperfect guy has this kind of tumultuous end. And people mention, like, when I saw him again later, he was a much nicer guy. But hey, you gotta fall, you gotta, hit a, you gotta bite a big old piece of humble pie in order to realize, just be a decent person. Maybe if he could settle down and... People enjoyed his hostility, but <clears throat> maybe settle down with the producers. Keep it in his pants, as some people would say. Maybe, just maybe, somehow they can work with the advertisers. They can work with, you know, the 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 MTV founder guy, Bob Pittman, said, "I didn't want, I didn't want to keep being this guy's babysitter." If you had that thing back to the day that you have this reserved resentment from of your dad, you want to be no matter what better than him, and then whatever the case may be, and then you become this popular overnight, absolute power corrupts absolutely, as people say, and uh, yeah, didn't work out for him. Like well, I said, they don't really go into when 1989 to like. He passed away in 2001. It was around 98, 99 that the, the lung cancer thing was going on. So, they don't really go into a whole lot of that. Like, what he did in between. Like, again, WrestleMania with Roddy Piper, Predator 2. I wish they would have talked a little bit about that stuff. It says it's about the guy born Downey Jr., but they didn't. And what he did in between that time... Like, what did he do in between that time? 
to make ends meet, to make money, to survive. Did he have other jobs? Did he have other shows somewhere? Like, what, what was the whole deal? I would like to have seen more of that. That's a big gap missing. That's probably my biggest complaint about it. But yeah, overall, I thought this was a very interesting documentary. Like I said, I like the animation segments. Uh, seeing all the clips of the Morn Downey Jr. itself, it makes me want to go watch some of them. Uh, you definitely see an influence nowadays with people ratcheting up their anger and whether they're talking about politics or liberals, conservative, whatever the case may be. But whether they want to admit it or not, there's definitely some kind of uh, influence. Even the the way the end credits, where it's like an homage to Rocky Horror Picture Show, but instead of the song "Double Feature," instead it's like a song about politic about uh, talk shows, like making fun like Geraldo. The Al Capone, who's in the nose, and then the Al Capone show. Yeah. Bye bye, Oprah, before she got thin. I, I, I'm doing a horrible job. I'm like, wow, they're doing a Rocky Horror Picture Show homage, and they're, they're like reworking, they're making like a new song and to the tune of Double Feet. Okay, I didn't expect that, but I guess it made sense because you see the Morton Downey Jr. Logo is like a mouth, so I guess that's the connection. I thought, okay, that was kind of interesting. But yeah, I thought this was a pretty intriguing documentary. Uh, talking heads that matter, that a lot of them were there for the... Even Sally Jesse Raphael was in this. She's in it only a couple times, but I'm like, oh shit, I remember Sally Jesse Raphael. This came out in 2012. It would have been nice to hear about Jerry Springer, what his thoughts would have been on Morn Downey Jr. Because I think that's what people would compare it to. And then Jerry Springer could talk about how he was different compared to this guy. And he was, so I think that's one guy they should have talked to is Jerry Springer. I think that would have been a good like comparison as to why his show... Whether you liked it or not, worked well enough and being successful. So, you know, why was Jerry Springer successful compared to Morgan Downey Jr. being only two years? But that being... I mean, if this is 2012, Jerry Springer would have still been going because that was, what, 2018 it ended, I said? So, it would have been nice to have that counterpoint. Uh, I think that was a missed opportunity. Noel Sharpton... They don't really interview his former, his, his last wife. But they don't interview his daughter. But overall, yeah, a lot of information. A lot of stuff I never knew about. And definitely a complicated guy, Morton Downey Jr. Definitely a complicated guy. But it was an interesting story to, to hear about, so... With that said, thanks for watching, take care, and we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye for now.